Okay, thank you. Oh, very good. Can everybody, can everybody hear me in the cheap seats? Okay, good. Ah, thank you. Excellent. So, uh, uh, the thing, the first thing to tell you about the II is that it's easily the weirdest member of the order, primates. Um, uh, uh, it's your weirdest primate relative. I know you're, you think that your Uncle Frank is pretty weird as a primate relative. This is weirder. He's got nothing on the II. Um, originally, the first uh, French naturalists who got pickled eye eyes shipped back to them for dissection in Paris concluded, and you can see that the, they could be forgiven for this, they concluded that eye eyes were rodents and not primates, and here's why. This is the skull of an eye eye, and what you see in the front of an eye eye's mouth are chisel shaped, ever growing, rodent like teeth that look for all the world like what you would see in the mouth of a beaver. And then the other really, and I, I know they're, they're weird looking, right? They've already got these big leathery bat ears and short faces and weird fur. But the, the other really particularly bizarre adaptation of eye eyes is this skinny, long, highly mobile middle finger. And yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Uh, and as you can see right here, this long mobile finger is a feeding adaptation just like these weird incisor teeth. And so what this eye eye has done, this is a captive eye eye at the Duke Lemur Center, it's nibbled a hole in the tip of this egg. Eye eyes don't normally eat egg in the wild, but this is something fun to give an eye eye, I guess. And you can see the long skinny finger is being drawn in and out of the egg to pull out the delicious juicy bits to eat. So, uh, now let me just show you guys the way an eye eye actually feel, uh, feeds in the wild. Eye eyes don't eat eggs. They specialize on eating wood-boring insects. And so here you go. How do you get into the grub inside? You use your beaver-like, chisel-shaped, ever-growing teeth to gnaw your way through. And look, here comes the terrible finger. <laughs> it's searching around for the grub. I mean, the grub doesn't have a chance at this point. And it's curtains for the grub. And they, now, there is, I don't know, did you guys notice the eye eye was tapping at the beginning of that video? Let me show you another video. This is a very specialized mode of foraging called percussive foraging. And so what the eye eye is doing here, it's listening with its big ears. There's the finger. And look, it's tapping. This is slowed down. It's tapping and sniffing and listening. It's listening for the sound of a void under, under the bark. And once it, it... It's like tapping on a wall to find a stud, right? You can hear if it's hollow or solid. So once it finds a void, it uses the teeth to get in there. And once the hole is big enough, in goes the finger. <laughs> Out comes the grub. And here's the very best part. It's coming up, I promise. Look at the look on its face. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Oh, I love grubs. It's so excellent. So, why did I start by talking about eye eyes other than the endless potentials for eye puns? Uh, uh, the point I want to make is this. Eye eyes are about as weird and divergent a primate as you can think of in terms of primate, primates with specialized niches in ecology. Uh, but despite all of the things that make eye eyes seem very odd to us and maybe even not primate-like in some ways, Eye eyes and humans and all other primates share at least one key fundamental feature of the visual system that sets them apart from most other mammals. Before I give you the hint, anyone, any, so here's Heidi Klum, here's an eye eye, right, human, an eye eye. Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah. Color vision. An excellent, an excellent guess. Carrie, are they monochromats? I think they're colorblind. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, somebody said, oh, binocular, uh, yeah. Look at this. Yes, in a word. The rabbit, the squirrel, the cow, right? Forward-facing eyes, no forward-facing eyes. And, and by the way, forward-facing eyes are one of the things that make non-human primates in the zoo seem strangely human-like. You know, you'll hear people in front of the monkey, monkey cage saying, it looks just like Aunt Jean, but I can't put my finger on why. You know, <laughs> part of that's the forward-facing eyes. So, all primates, whether, whether we're talking about handsome human primates, our close ape relatives, some more distant relatives, things like owl monkeys or bush babies, all primates share forward-facing eyes. And in this respect, this feature is one of the things you can use to distinguish a primate from a non-primate mammal. 
So I, I, let me know if I'm spitting on you guys too much. Okay? I'm not used to lecturing with a light in my face so I can see all the spittle coming out up here. <laughs> So as, as, a, as a biological, physical anthropologist, uh, I'm interested in the why questions of evolution. Uh, and so the, the question I want to pose is, why? Why have all primates got forward-facing eyes? Why do most mammals not have forward-facing eyes? What are they good for? If all primates, regardless of their specialization, diurnal, nocturnal, leaf eaters, insect eaters, you name it, why have they all got forward-facing eyes? And, and let me just say, there's several different ways to answer this question. The first, and I know this is not a very good answer, but I at least need to mention this, is an evolutionary answer. And that's that forward-facing eyes were present in the last common ancestor of living primates. And as a result, all living primates retain characteristics of that common ancestor. And so here you can see the major groups of living primates, the lemurs and lorises, tarsiers, we'll get to them in a second, monkeys, apes, and humans. And the way you read these diagrams of evolutionary relationships is every branch point represents a common ancestor at some point in the past. And so we're talking about adaptations that had appeared by the time of the last common ancestor of living primates. And so, put it another way, if that common ancestor has got forward-facing eyes, and that's what you inherit, unless there's a good reason to lose it, you know, this is the evolutionary baggage that you've got. There's somebody signaling down here if you're looking for somebody. Here's a functional answer, and I can't see through the glare, but somebody in front of me said binocular vision. The functional answer is that forward-facing eyes give you a wider field of binocular vision. And it means if you, you know, know anything about uh, the, the etymology, bind two ocular eyes. Uh, binocular vision is seeing the world with two eyes simultaneously. And what you're looking at is a, a, a cartoon looking down on top of the head of an owl monkey, and you can see the field of space viewed by each eye. Here's the cone of space viewed by the right eye. Here's the cone of space viewed by the left eye. And what you can see is in this owl monkey, as in you and me and all primates, most of the space in front of the animal's nose is viewed by both eyes simultaneously. And if you guys have never noticed this, you can, you can map out your own visual space pretty easily. You close, close one eye and you come around to the bridge of your nose, and then you close the other eye and you come around to the bridge of your nose, and then you open both eyes, and what you realize is everything between your hands, you're seeing with both eyes at the same time, and there's only this very narrow field of monocular, one-eyed vision out here in the visual periphery. So if you've got forward-facing eyes, most of your visual space is viewed by two eyes simultaneously. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Okay. Somewhat. <laughs> Good enough. All right. What your brain does, each eye sees a slightly different image of what's right in front of your face. And your brain takes these slightly different images from each eye and it combines them into a single perceptual image. Uh, and this process is called binocular fusion, right? So most of us have got binocular fusion and this happens, this happens without us having to think about it, right? You're not constantly thinking, oh gosh, I forgot to combine the image from my right eye and my left eye. And I was looking out of my left eye by mistake. I should have been looking out of both eyes, right? So, and let me just say, not everybody in this room has got binocular vision. And as my, my colleague Matt Cartmill used to say, the way you test is you look for the floating hot dog. Okay? So bear with me. Uh, watch first and then try it yourself. What you're going to do is you're going to focus on something behind me at the front of the room, just going to look forward past anything on the dais here, and you're going to put your hands at arm's length out in front of you, like this, fingers together, and you're, and you're going to put them right in front of your eyes, but you're not going to focus on them. You're going to look past them. And as you look past them, you'll slowly draw your fingers apart, and if you see the floating hot dog, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah? Give it a try. Yeah, so the floating hot dog is there because of binocular fusion. Now, let me ask. I got I to gotta block out the... All right, let me ask. Hands up. How many of you could see the floating hot dog? Most of you. Okay, those hands down. Thank you. Hands up. How many people couldn't see the floating hot dog? A few brave souls can't see the floating hot dog. It should be about 5 to 10% of the people in the room. Let me ask. If you couldn't see the floating hot dog, how many of you guys had lazy eye when you were a kid? That guy right there. So, um, and, and you, couldn't see the, you couldn't see the floating hot dog? No. All right. What happens is uh, uh, you've got a critical period 
of visual development when you're an infant. And if your brain, if for example, with lazy eye, if one eye points in a different direction than the other, the images your two, two eyes get are so different that your brain can't figure out how to fuse them together, and it finally stops trying at a very early age. But, um, what's your name? Dave. Dave. Um, are you aware of the fact that you have an amazing visual ability that the rest of us with binocular fusion don't have? No. Uh, do, are you aware of the fact that you can consciously shift your attention from looking to one eye out of the other eye? No. Do you think you can? <laughs> Anybody else who couldn't see the floating hot dog? Yeah? Are you aware that you can do that? Oh, yeah, he's like, I just got the lazy eye thing. Well, <laughs> most people who don't have, try, try it at home, okay? Uh, if you couldn't see the floating hot dog, most people with, uh, that don't have bin the capacity for binocular fusion switch very rapidly between looking out of their right eye and their left eye, and they can consciously shift, which is a pretty cool skill, because in order for me to shift from one eye to the other, I have to do this, right? I can't decide, now I'm going to look out of my right eye. Now I'm just going to look out of my left eye. Anyway. All right, enough of that. So, what binocular fusion leads to, ultimately, is another perception, okay? So this is all in our internal visual world. And it's a perception of three-dimensionality called stereopsis. So, stere so in, in other words, vision with a single eye doesn't have the same sense of depth of three-dimensionality that vision with two eyes does. Stereopsis is the perception of three-dimensional space you get from binocular fusion. And, partly because of stereopsis, here's the key point. Binocular vision is absolutely critical for making fine depth judgments. If you don't have binocular vision, you can't do it. You don't have to have stereopsis, you just have to have binocular vision. And so I, I could talk for another 10 minutes about why this is the case. It would be much easier for me to just demonstrate with a volunteer. So somebody without glasses, with good vision, who wouldn't mind coming up here? Yeah, so come on up. Thank you. So what's your name? Evan. Evan, nice to meet you. Thank you. This is Evan. Hi, All right, hooray! <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm going to have you face this way so the glare doesn't affect this. So you can just stand right there. What you're going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hold my finger up. Right? Let's not do the finger. Let's do, let's do the tip of this, okay? So what, what I'm going to try to get you to do is I'm going to ask you to put your, your right arm out to the right like this. So other arm, other arm. Okay, good. Now hold it out to the side with your finger forward. Good. Okay, so what you're going to do is when I say go, you're going to bring your finger in from the side like this, and you're going to touch the tip of the pointer. So, and, and here's the trick. You're going to have to take this hand and cover up that eye and not peek. So you have to do it with just one eye. So you can only see with one eye. Okay, you ready to do this? We're going to go for two out of three. So swing that finger on in from the side and touch it. Oh, oh. That's what you were supposed to do. Let's try again. Let's go two for three. Ready? All right, bring it on in. Touch the tip. Bring it on Oh, he was so close. Okay, wait. Here's the control. Go ahead and drop that hand. Now do the same thing. Bring it in and touch the tip. There you go. Thank you. Perfect. That was great. So you'll notice, two eyes, he gets it. It's, it's, it's child's play, right? One eye, he's close, but no cigar. So you have some idea of how far away things are from your face based on monocular cues, but you have to have binocular vision to really hit it on the money. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? Hope so. Okay, good. Keep that in mind. Here's the ecological answer for why we've got forward-facing eyes. It's much less obvious. Um, the ecological answer... Uh, uh, let me just pose this question. Why might primates benefit from having improved depth perception? And your hint is this Indri, a kind of lemur sitting in a tree. Anybody have any thoughts? Yes. For predators. Okay, maybe for judging the distance to predators. That's your, but everybody has to judge the distance to predators, right? Yes. Tree leaping. Yes. Most primates to this day still live in the trees. I mean, you and I and baboons are exceptions. But this is... 
an older and very intuitively appealing idea in physical anthropology. Uh, and it's the idea that forward-facing eyes and improved depth perception are necessary for life in the trees, for being arboreal. And so here's a great example of an arboreal primate, a shafaka. Uh, shafaka is another type of lemur in Madagascar. And the way shafaka get from tree to tree, they eat leaves, the way they get from tree to tree is not by climbing down to the ground and walking across and climbing up the next tree. They hurl their bodies out into the void, leaping from tree to tree with wild abandon. And yes, that was, in fact, an old Flash Gordon the Movie reference for you guys. You're welcome. Okay, so, look, and the idea is this. The, the, the shafak is over here in this tree. It's going to leap to the other tree. And if it's close but no cigar, that's not going to cut it, right? The shafak is in serious trouble. Yes? So does the forward-facing eyes? Oh, he stole my point. If you, if, if you heard that, forget it for just a second. Hopefully, without hearing that, that, that very good point that the man just made, uh, you will think to yourself, yes, forward-facing eyes, life in the trees, you know, binocular vision is all about improved depth perception, and lemurs have to leap from tree to tree, and other primates have to get around in the trees. It makes sense, right? Can you guys at least give me that it makes sense? Yeah? Okay, good. Thank you. That's what I wanted you to say. And this is the part where I say, what's wrong with this hypothesis? Squirrels! That's right. Here is a consummate arborealist, and I submit to you, for many years of observation, undergraduates can peaceably lunch under the big oak trees here on campus without a hail of squirrels falling down on them because they haven't been able to accurately judge the distance of, the, of their leaps. They leap from tree to tree just fine, and yet they have sideways facing eyes. In fact, most arboreal mammals don't have forward facing eyes. Here's another squirrel. I picked these two arboreal mammals, a tree shrew and a colugo, because these are our closest living non-primate relatives. Yeah, that's right. You are more closely related to a tree shrew and a colugo than you are to an elephant or a dog or a cat. So, yeah, thank you. Anyway, uh, what we have here is a couple of you know, more arboreal mammals that don't have forward-facing eyes. And in this type of science, we're using what we call the comparative method to try to falsify hypothesis. Uh, in this type of science, if you find counterexamples to uh, uh, your causal explanation, you're in trouble. You need to go back to the drawing board. You need to revise. You need to think some more. In fact, keep in mind, you know, we shouldn't be surprised to hear that most arboreal mammals have got sideways facing eyes, because most mammals do, whether they're perissodactyls like tapirs or bunnies or rodents or you know, this, elephant shrews have their own order, macroscalidia. Right? There are loads of animals that don't have forward-facing eyes in the mammalian world. There aren't that many that do have forward-facing eyes. So the way you play this game, the way you refine your hypothesis, is you then ask, ask the question, who does have forward-facing eyes besides primates? Yes. What kind of predators? Wild cats. Yes. Yes, field carnivores. Absolutely. Your dogs are pretty good but they don't have eyes that are as forward-facing as a cat, right? I grew up with a Pekingese, so I'm used to a dog with bug eyes. <laughs> yes? Raptors. So raptors, most raptors uh, have got visual axes or eyes that face out at about a 45-degree angle, your average eagle or something like that. Tell me about a kind of raptor that's really got forward-facing eyes. Owls. Thank you. This is not rocket science. This is the comparative method. Anyone can play this game. So, the big two are owls and cats. And what you then say is, is there anything similar about these two unrelated groups of vertebrates that do have forward-facing eyes? And I submit to you, yes, there is. They're predators. They hunt at night. And they are reliant on vision for hunting. Now, I know cats and owls have got great sense of hearing, but they use their eyes for hunting. Guess what? Guess what the last common ancestor primates did for a living in terms of getting its food? Hunting. Yes. Here you go. Teardina asiatica, 55, 56 million years old from China. The earliest definite fossil primate in the fossil record. And here are its teeth. Look at these things. Now we infer, and there's, there's a fair amount of evidence that these guys have got, uh, uh, um, that they were nocturnal. We can see from the anatomy that they had forward-facing eyes from the eye sockets. I know it's a little pancaked here, but there are other... Uh, good specimens. But these teeth 
are the dead giveaway for a predator. I mean, look at how pointy and, and crusty they are. Now, this thing could have fit in the palm of my hand. So what we have here is a bug's worst nightmare from 56 million years ago. So the, the basal adaptation for the last common ancestor of living primates was predatory. We know from the fossil record that this is the case. The key here has to do with the mode of prey capture. So, many predators capture prey with their mouths, whether it's this, I guess it's an alligator, some of the VP crowd is probably cringing because it's probably a crocodile. What is it? It's a croc. Okay, anyway. All right, so it's, it's, it's grabbed a fish. Here's a ball python that's grabbed a rat. Here is a shrew that's grabbed a beetle. Lots of predators just run in and hurr, grab with their mouths. Not so for some specialized predators. Some predators do things very differently. So let me give you an example of a primate predator. Your friend, the tarsier. Tarsiers are found in Southeast Asia. Look at their teeth. Not too different from Teardina Asiatica 56 million years ago. Something for spicing and dicing bugs. Okay? They are 100% faunivorous. That is, they eat bugs and baby birds and snakes and things like that. Um, a couple of more cool things about tarsiers, because they're almost as cool as eye eyes. Uh, big rat tail. Uh, they're small, like most primate predators, like our last common ancestor for all primates. Look at these hands. Oh, my goodness. That is a freaky, freaky big hand. You'll see why they have these big hands. And they also have big feet for leaping around in the trees. I just have to say, tarsiers are also cool. This is a little bit not in the direct line of the talk, but I have to at least mention, at tarsier, each eyeball is bigger than its brain. <laughs> And you, you can actually see it here. You can hear this tarsier saying, hates the Chixi Hobbitses. Where's the precious? Right? I mean... Now, as a consummate primate predator, let me show you guys how a tarsier hunts and gets its dinner. All right, there's a bug. Here's the hungry tarsier. They typically hunt in the bottom two meters of the forest. He sees a bug. Jumps down, and boom, there it is. Did you see it? There it was. What, you didn't see it? It's really fast, right? Well, there it is, eating the bug at leisure. The capture of the bug is pretty impressive. Let me break it down for you. This is how a lot of primate predators get their prey, if not all of them, in, in, in terms of the, the, the overall broad strokes. Here it is, scanning, listening, scanning with those eyes, those great big freaky eyes. Here's the leap. And what I want you to notice is that the, the, the eyelids are narrowed down like gun sights, but they're still open. So the tarsier is locked on target, it's leapt from over here, and these freaky big man hands are ready to grab. <laughs> and so here's the tarsier, it's landed, there's a Katie did or something like that, I apologize to the entomologists in the audience. Look, the eyes are still slitted, but look, here comes the hand. And the tarsier knows exactly how far away that bug is, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and here's the bite. And notice that the eyes are completely closed now because if you miss, you don't want a Katie did to jump in your giant eyeball. <laughs> I, I will say, when I was first in grad school, I went around trying to grab every bug at night with my hand. I quickly realized if you don't close your eyes at the same time, they land in your eye and it hurts. Anyway, the point is this. This is going to be a tarsier that's very hungry if it's close but no cigar. Am I right? You need to know how far away that bug is before you grab it. How do cats get their food? Yeah, cats lock on target with eyes and ears the same way. And when the cat comes in to get the poor hapless rodent, whatever this is, it's not the mouth that makes contact first. It's this mighty terrible paw that reaches out to bat the rodent around a little bit before finally there's a killing bite. Some cats, I just want to say, some cats like cheetahs are specialized for tripping their prey. Look at this. Look, locked on target, steady head. Knows how far away that gazelle is, trips it. Wait, it's not over. This cat is so confident, it's going to let the gazelle get back up so you can have a better view. So look at this. There goes the gazelle. Watch. Locked on. Knows how far away it is. Gazelle bobs and weaves. But look, here's the trip. 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 <laughs> trip. 
And it's curtains for the gazelle. That's right, it's the cycle of life. Sorry. I didn't rehearse with singing, I just want you guys to know. All right. Owls, how do owls get their food? You guys know where I'm going with this, right? Here's an owl swooping in, some hapless lemming or vole or something like that. And of course, here's the money shot right here. So the owl comes in, both talons doing their business of snatching up that rodent. And look, there are the eyes locked on target. The owl knows exactly how far away that rodent is before it strikes. And, and I just have to show you guys this because it's so cool. Here's an owl that not only does all of that, but it also compensates for differences in looking through water and the, the refractive differences. So here comes the owl. It's locked on. Talons go in and trout. Trout for dinner. Yes. So then, then it, I love that it walks away. It's all wet, right? You guys didn't think of chameleons when I asked you for animals with forward-facing eyes, right? Because everybody knows a chameleon has eyes that move around independently of one another. You guys have all seen this, right? Do you guys know you have... Trust me, they do. They move around like this. It's really weird. You should check it out. Do you guys know what a chameleon does right before it shoots its tongue out? Right when it locks on? There you go. <laughs> hey, another, another hunter catching its prey with an appendage using binocular vision to judge distance. This is why forward-facing eyes evolve. Snatching mice, getting your paw on mice, or getting your big freaky man hands on Katie did, and things like that. Each three of these species requires fine visual depth perception to capture prey with an appendage. You guys buy it? Yeah. Thank you. It's called the visual predation hypothesis. So what these comparisons are showing us is that the reason, that, that I should say, you know, you never really know it with these sorts of comparative studies, but all of the evidence converges in the same direction, and that is that forward-facing eyes were present in the last common ancestor of primates as a predatory adaptation. We know that they were predatory, right? We know that they were, if they were predators, they were probably snatching bugs with their hands, just like tarsiers, and so on. The problem with this, of course, uh, if there is any problem, is... Well, you could easily play the, play the game the other way and say, well, most primates are not predators today. And that's true. But then I would counter by saying, you ready? I would say, well, if you don't have any reason to lose them, why would you? I know, and you can play that game on ad infinitum. Yeah, this is my best, my best line of evidence to present to you guys for why the forward-facing eyes are there. We know it's not arboreality in and of itself. It's almost certainly there as a predatory adaptation. So there you go, thinking about humans and what we do. The next time you see somebody doing this, or this, or pretty much anything that requires really fine depth perception, I mean, think about how hard it was to hit those nostrils on the first try. Remember that the ability to precisely judge distances to the visual target comes from having forward-facing eyes because your distant ancestors used to eat stuff like this. All right, moving on. For the second part of the talk, I want to talk about what I consider to be a truly amazing ability that evolves in the last common ancestor of tarsiers, you know what those are now, monkeys, apes, and humans. So we've moved one branch point down the tree, and this is a group of primates, tarsiers, monkeys, apes, and humans, called the haplorines. Haplorines. Are you ready? What do you see? A face, Nefertiti. That's right. How did you see that? You looked at it. I know. When you looked at it, what did you do? Did you, did you park on the little girl's nose and just take it all in? Let's try this again. I'm going to go back. I want you guys, I'm going to show you the same images. This time, instead of saying, I wonder what those are, I, as you look at them, I want you to think about what your eyes are doing. Are you ready? Not parked in one place, are they? Now, I know you switched back and forth. What your eyes really did, and it, it only took milliseconds to do this, everybody in this room looked over, excuse me, looked over here at the little girl, 
looked from one eye to the other, down to the nose, the mouth all the way around the face, looked at the bangs, looked at the chin, looked at the mouth, the nose. This happened in the space of less than a second. These are reflexive eye movements called saccades. And saccades, it, it, so if you look at me right now, right, you're not just looking at me and seeing me. You just open your eyes and there I am. You're sweeping your eyes around all of my parts, as it turns out. Yeah. And, and what you're doing is you sweep your eyes around any object that you're looking at. And again, it just takes a matter of milliseconds. It's so fast. You don't even know you're doing it. What you're doing is you are building up an image in your mind's eye, in your brain, of what you're looking at. And here, if you're not convinced, uh, here over a period of seconds are the tracks of the eyes as they sweep over these images. You can see some things in Nefertiti, like the profile in the ear, get a lot of hits. Some places with not much contrast don't get looked at all that much. And your eyes, as long as you're doing this, are sweeping around and around and around. It's like you're refreshing the buffers in your mind's eye. So, these are tracks of what you call the retinal fovea. It's one little part of your retina. Here's what it looks like. Fovea in Latin means pit. So here is a pit. In, in this case, it's a, a monkey, a macaque. Here's a pit in the middle of the retina. That's the fovea. When you look at something, when I look at you, or when I look at you, I'm pointing my fovias, one in each eye, at whatever I look at. And that's what you guys do when you look at something. What this is, fundamentally, is an adaptation for giving incoming light an unobstructed path to the photoreceptors in your retina. That is, the cells that actually absorb light and start the cascade that's going to send a signal to your brain. So look at this. Um, and I just have to say, I have to say it this way because we're in Texas. Are you ready? If you were an intelligent designer and you were looking and you were going to build a retina in your infinite wisdom, right? And you knew that this is the back side of the retina down here and this is the front side up here. So light's coming in from the top of the screen. Where would you put the photoreceptors? On the top. These ain't the photoreceptors right here. These are the ganglion cells that are talking to the brain. These are layers of processing cells and all of their dendrites and axons and all that kind of stuff. The photoreceptors are on the wrong side. They're down here. What's going on? Oh my God. It's freaking me out. So what this means is for most of your retina, a photon of light comes in and has to pass through all this other schlach. That's what the scientists call it, schlach. And so, look, it hits a ganglion cell, cell body, pew, it bounces off, it gets absorbed, it scatters. This is not an optimal way to build a retina, right? What's happening with the fovea is all of these inner layers of cells are shoved to the side. It's the one little part of your retina where sanity prevails. And all the photoreceptors down here have a nearly unobstruct, unobstructed path for the incoming light. So, there's something else that's cool about phobias. Each phobia has its own yellow filter built in. So what you're looking at are, this is a thin slice through a fovea. This is the same thin slice viewed in green light and blue light. What you're seeing is the absorption of blue light by a dense concentration of, of uh, plant pigments, carotenoids. They're called lutein and zeaxanthin. They are yellow. And if you guys, it sounds familiar, it's because the gurus of uh, vitamin supplementation in the last five years have decided that lutein is the new big thing. So you've heard the ads on t TV. New Centrum Silver now with lutein. Lutein may be an important part of eye health. That sort of thing, right? So, here it is. You can't make it. You can only get it from your leafy greens and, and other sorts of, of vegetables. So plants synthesize it. You take it and you shove it all into your fovea. And remember, light's coming from the bottom. Light's being absorbed here by the photoreceptors. So what this yellow, what this yellow pigment concentration is doing, in addition to possibly or likely preventing some oxidative damage, it's filtering out the blue and violet light. You guys don't know when you look directly at a blue object that you're not seeing the blue with your fovea because your brain is interpolating. And it's saying, ah, oh, it's blue all around. We'll just call it across the whole fovea right there, right? In any case, it's one of the differences between visual perception and what the retina actually detects. But it's the exact same principle behind wearing yellow shooting glasses when you're trap shooting. What you do, oh, and by the way, I should mention, why would you want to get rid of blue light? Blue light comes into focus in front of your retina. Yellow light comes into focus right on the money. So what the fovea is doing here is it's filter, filtering out blurring blue light and it's admitting light that's going to be in sharp focus. So we're not scattering incoming light. 
We're filtering out blurring blue and violet light. Look at this. In the center of the phobia, you've got an incredibly dense concentration of cone photoreceptor cells. These are the cells in your retina that are responsible for detecting light during the day. Uh, they're responsible for your sense of visual details and for color vision. And here are all of the cones crammed in cheek by jowl in the middle of the fovea. And here, the big fat ones are the cones just eight millimeters outside the fovea. What are these things you wonder? These are rods. These are active at night. So imagine that by day, here's your sampling apparatus for stuff that you point your fovea at. Here's your sampling apparatus for stuff that's just outside the fovea. And wh what this is, this is like the difference between an HD image and a conventional image, right? The more photoreceptors you sample an image with, the finer the grain, the greater the clarity that's passed on to your brain. So what this means is that phobias, if you ask what is a, a phobia all about, the phobia, well, let me just say, the answer is without your phobia, you can't perform most tasks involving visual details. And so what I need is somebody else with 20-20 vision, good vision, no, uh, no glasses. Yes, come on up. Excellent. Thank you, excellent. Uh, what's your name? I'm Gus. Gus, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Gus, you. everybody. This is going to be really simple, Gus. What you're going to do is you're going to keep your eyes facing in this direction. You're going to be tempted to look at me. You are going to resist that temptation. Yes? Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come right over here. I'm going to hold up some fingers. Are you ready? Okay, now don't look at me. You have to use your peripheral visual field for this. How many fingers am I holding up, Gus? Four. Four. Ooh, it's four. Can you see my hand? A little bit. A little bit. How many fingers? Three. Oh, that was pretty good. Okay, let's try this another way. All right, eyes forward. Can everybody see this? What a, Gus, what am I holding up? I have no idea. How about now? Oh, we looked at it. Okay. <laughs> okay, you'll resist the temptation again. Are you ready? Let's see if I can... Uh, All right, eyes this way. Okay, what have I got? A pack of bubble gum. pack of bubble gum. He hears it. He's interpolating. All right, how about now? I'm getting closer. You can see something in my hand, right? What color is it? Blue and yellow. Oh, that's pretty good. All right, how about now? Can you see what it is? What is it? Oh, he looked at it again. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. That was great. Very good. Thank you. I gotta say, Gus did better than I thought he would. He got the fingers pretty fast. I guess everybody's gonna guess three fingers. Were you guessing or could you see him? Uh, the first one I could, the second one was a guess. It was a guess, all right. So there you go. Your ability to see visual details in the world around you is dependent on having a healthy, functioning fovea. Fovias are adaptations for extraordinarily acute vision. What is visual acuity? It's your ability to see visual details. Anytime you go to the, the eye doctor and they have you look at an eye chart and read off the letters, they're testing your visual acuity. This is why a, 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 a disease called macular degeneration is so debilitating. This is where the cells around your fovea and inside your fovea start to proliferate in such a way that your, your fovea starts to break down. And once your fovea is knocked out, it's just a tiny little patch of your retina. But once it's gone, there's a whole world of visual stuff you can't do. This is why you shouldn't stare at the sun, too, by the way. Now, among mammals, fovias are only found in a select group of animals. You want to hear what they are? Yes. yes. Good. I'm going a little bit long. One person wants to know. Tarsiers. Monkeys, apes, and humans. That's right. The haplorine primates. These are the only mammals that have a retinal phobia in each eye. And as such, this is a, an evolutionary biologist would say this is an extremely derived adaptation of this group. Uh, and let me, let me break it down for you. I'm going to give you visual acuity for various mammals, our mammalian brethren, on a scale from 0 to 90. And I don't want to, I don't want to get, spend too much time explaining what cycles per degree are. I'll just say that as you move from 0 to 90, visual acuity increases. So, moving in this direction, higher and higher and higher visual acuity. 
Here are almost all haplorines, the day active monkeys, apes, and humans. And by the way, 40 to 80 cycles per degree, it's the humans at the 80 cycles per degree in. That is unbelievably high visual acuity. And by the way, Jay wanted me, me to remind you guys, this is, we're talking about humans with 20-20 vision. You know, real mortals like you and I, who read and look at TV monitors and things like that, end up a little nearsighted, a little farsighted, a little stigmatism from birth. So we're, we're talking about a perfect sort of best case scenario for humans with 20-20 vision. They're out there, I'm told. Here are the only two night active haplorines. The tarsier down here at nine cycles per degree. That's from Carrie's work, by the way. And an owl monkey at 10 cycles per degree. So a bit lower because they've got a lot more rods in their retina. They're adapted for sensitivity at night. Guess where the non-haplorine mammal with the highest acuity falls here? There you go. A horse. That's right. Who's been around horses? Their eyes are about as big as baseballs, right? So a horse with its baseball-sized eye doesn't come close to our cherry-sized eye in acuity. Here's another extraordinarily large-eyed mammal with much lower visual acuity than the lion's share of haplorines. You guys want to see where everybody else is? That's right. Everybody else is down here. Down in the low range. You got your mice and your bats. Everybody knows bats are blind. Not exactly, not quite. Squirrels have got good vision. Seals and, and elephants have got good vision. Four cycles per degree. The point is this. One of the little known facts about what makes humans highly unusual compared to other mammals. Everybody knows about language or big brains or tool use and things like that. This is right up there with them. The fact that humans can see with this extraordinarily high visual acuity is a very, very neat trick indeed compared to other mammals. And so for my friends who like arrested development. Um, uh, can anybody guess what other... We're not talking about mammals now. We're talking about anything with a backbone. What other vertebrates have got higher visual acuity than a mammal? Birds. Yes, birds. What kind of birds? They have two phobias. Birds have got two phobias. Raptors. That's right. Actually, it's not all raptors. It's the day-active raptors with really big eyes. So if you... And, and by the way, this raptor does indeed have two phobias, one that looks forward and one that looks out to the side in each eye. It's a pretty cool trick. Right, so the only way you can take an eye like this and give it higher acuity than it already has is to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And these guys have got ridiculously big eyes under those feathers. So, all right. Is everybody with me that phobias are about high acuity? I know I'm running a little bit long. They're about high acuity and they are very unusual, at least for mammals, right? Everybody's on the same page? What are they good for? What do you do with them? And without going, into too much, uh, uh, without going into too much detail, no pun intended, what I'll say is this. Low acuity limits your options for what you can do with vision. High acuity enhances your options for what you can do with vision. And there's a reason I chose some camouflaged you know, frog and a moth and a stink bug and some other food up here, some cherries or whatever those are. It turns out, and this is not true for all, this is true for many or most, many or most non-primates that have phobias, so we're talking about birds and lizards and things like that, they are diurnal, they are predatory, and they hunt by sight. By the way, this Anolis lizard has got two phobias in each eye just like this bird does. It's pretty cool. I think that's true. Somebody look it up for me. Anyway, look, so what we have here is phobias and very high acuity almost certainly evolving as another predatory adaptation. But in this case, a day-active predatory adaptation for hunting with keen eyesight by day. Again, snatching bugs by day in your haplorine common ancestor. Now that being said, what's really cool about this high acuity <laughs> is that in a subset of haplorines, so if you kick the tarsiers out of haplorine, you're left with a group called anthropoidea, monkeys, apes, and humans, so most haplorines. In the anthropoid primates, high acuity evolves almost certainly as a predatory adaptation, but it gets co-opted very early on for another functional context. And that is the context of social communication based on visual signals. And, and I think we can agree, look, there's some visual signals being conveyed here with facial expressions. 
this is a cool anthropoid trick that if you think about it, most other mammals don't do this. Most other mammals don't go, when they're happier, mm, when they're madder, mm, when they're angry, right? Your dog may turn its head and give you the confused sideways look, but it's still giving you that dog look, right? <laughs> yes. So, there you go, that dog look. The point is this. For mammals, I know, you guys, you guys think what the neighborhood tomcat does to your car windshield is bad? Be glad that you are not, you know, there are no cheetahs roaming around. Here is a cheetah scent marking with urine. Here is a ringtail lemur, a primate, scent marking with its anogenital glands. Uh, you know, anybody who's ever taken a dog for a walk, what are they really interested in? Every nasty, stinky smelling thing that you come across. A dead rat, a fire hydrant, we know why. Yeah, exactly. This is why dogs are keenly interested in the hind ends of other dogs. The social, and I'm not saying they don't have visual social signals. I'm just saying that the lion's share of the social communication in most mammals, and primitively for mammals, is with olfaction, with smell. But in anthropoids, it's different. One thing I haven't told you is that anthropoids have got really lousy senses of smell. But look at this. Visually mediated signals, particularly facial expressions, are absolutely fundamental for social communication in us and our close primate relatives, the monkeys and apes. This includes things like affiliative signals. This is a play face. This guy's getting tickled, okay? Baby smiling. The cool thing about this is nobody has to teach a baby how to smile. They just start doing it, right? Nobody has to teach a baby how to frown. They just start doing it, right? These are innate, inborn signals for social communication, and it's all happening right up here. There are threats. I like the threats because I want to make this point. This is a fairly conspicuous threat from this monkey, right? It's saying, look at my giant canines, look at my scary white eye patches. I'm looking at you, Buster. You're in trouble. You're about to get bit, right? Here is what for all the world looks like a yawning baboon. That baboon is not tired. That baboon is directing this yawn at somebody off camera. Maybe the cameraman. <laughs> We're getting too close. Or camera woman. But then I want to make this point here. What if this is a threat? What if all you need to threaten someone is stare at them? Okay, did you feel uncomfortable? She felt uncomfortable. That's right. This is, a, as I told Commander Ben, this is a near universal anthropoid threat, the stare. Right? Let me ask you this. If you've got lousy visual acuity and somebody's staring at you and you don't, you know, put your hiney up in the air and smack your lips, this is what submissive baboons do. You're in trouble, right? You're going to get bit. You've got to receive the visual signals you need high acuity to do it. Here's some signals that convey submission or fear. This is called a fear grimace. And, and the reason I like this fear grimace is not just because it's subtle, but because the monkey has scared itself because it picked up the camera and saw its own reflection and kind of went, oh, my God. Here's the mandrels playing. These are kids. They're having fun. They like each other. Look at their faces as they do this. See the lips retracted? They're about to start going crazy again. Watch. Watch the face. See? Did you see that down there? You guys, it, it, you would be forgiven for thinking that they're having a fight. These are playing monkeys. And the play face says, hey, I know I'm biting you and pulling on your tail and stuff like that. I'm just playing. I'm not really mad at you. This is an important social signal to convey. Now here's what a real threat looks like. These are gelata baboons, and I picked this because this is a spectacular threat display from a monkey. <laughs> it's called the lip flip. There's a little color thrown in there for good measure. Right? There's some more color too. Look, there, there are the white eyebrow patches. Right? That's a threat too. So what we have is a group of males that are trading agonistic or sort of angry, non-affiliative signals with one another, we know where this is headed. It's headed toward fighting and chasing and things like that. The point is this. If you live in a group... So did I say mandrels? I meant to say gelatas. I hope I said gelatas. These are gelata baboons in the Ethiopian highlands. The point is this. If you're a gelata and you're happily eating grass and you're in a social group of 100 individuals and some big male 50 feet away from you is staring at you, threatening you, 
letting you know that you as a male are too close to a female that he's interested in, if you don't have the high acuity to see the stare and respond accordingly to this social signal, you're in trouble, right? So this is really, all of these visual signals that are dependent on high acuity are really important for anthropoid primates. So important, in fact, that anthropoids, uniquely among mammals, have evolved, again, sorry for all the spitting, have evolved a series of superficial facial muscles that are there specifically to move the skin of your face around, right? So like, look at this, look at this one right here. The levator labii superioris aloqui nasi, right? The muscle, here, I'm going to use it, ready? Did you see it? it? It flares my nostril and lifts my upper lip a little bit. Why do I have that muscle? For dealing with twitchy noses? For it? No, it's there so that I can make all of these amazing faces that humans can make to let you know if I'm in love or if I'm sad or I mean, whatever, right? So, there's the anatomy there uh, for sending these signals. So, what you end up with is each anthropoid species, here are some human faces for, you know, consideration, each anthropoid species has its own repertoire of characteristic spatial expressions that are used for social communication and that are dependent on the recipient having high enough acuity to get even the subtle ones. So the ability to read subtle differences is partly dependent on having high acuity and that's dependent on having a functioning phobia. Thank you very much. So, here's the big picture. Just as you learned that the ability to use your forward-facing eyes to figure out how far away stuff is in space from you is dependent on, it's related to nocturnal predation in the common ancestor of all primates. Um, what I want you to remember is the next time you use facial expressions to tell that a toddler is happy, the next time you use facial expressions <laughs> to tell that someone is angry, Yes? I, I don't know who posted Angry Baby online the first time, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> or, when you're reading the subtle signals that tell you that something is slightly amiss, in this case, the zombie apocalypse, right? I want you to remember that your ability to read these signals is dependent on the fact that you almost quite literally have eagle eyes, both in terms of the anatomy of phobia and the high acuity, and the reason you've got eagle eyes is because you're just an ancestor. The anthropoids like to wake up during the day and eat bugs. That's right. Eat bugs. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can I... Can I do, do you mind if I say something go, real quick? Go. I... Um, Thanks, everybody, for staying. I know I ran a little bit late. I just want to say that I, I wouldn't be here today if it was not for having some absolutely phenomenal teachers of my own before I got to be a teacher at UT, which has been a, essentially a dream my whole life. And I just want to say it's my great pleasure to discover that my sixth and seventh grade life sciences teacher, Ms. Pam Watson, is here in the audience. And I want to say... If you stand up... This woman is one of the most profoundly gifted educators I've ever encountered in my entire life. And it's because of the efforts of people like her and all the other educators who are here in the audience that we get to do the things that we do. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Okay. Please remain in your seats. Uh, Dr. Kirk will be happy to answer your questions. Who's got a question? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, so the question was, when you take a driver's license test, are they testing your depth perception or your visual acuity? Anytime you're reading across the, the, the letters, across the lines, and having a hard time with the bottom row, that is a test of acuity. And uh, the, those letters are in a font where the little, like, you, you'll notice it's hard to tell the difference between an O and a C, the gap for the C is just big enough that they can precisely estimate what your acuity is based on where you can no longer make that discrimination. Good question. And how does this connect with the phobia? 
How does it connect with the phobia? Suffice to say that if you don't have well-functioning phobias, you wouldn't be able to drive a car successfully. I mean, I, I, I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who's got macular degeneration who has experience with it, but as I understand it, it is profoundly debilitating. There's so many things you can't do without a phobia. And, you know, it's not just, it's not just your vision for details, it's your vision for color. Um, and there are things that the visual periphery do really well. Visual periphery detects motion really well. So when you see something zipping in like a baseball that you weren't ready for, your, your periphery alerts you to that. But the acuity and the color vision, it's not there. Yes? If you were to put a human in a room and eliminate the yellow light, would they be able to see clearly? Ooh. So if you put, if you put a, rumen, a, a human, not a rumen, that's in a cow's stomach. If you, if you put a human in a room and you eliminate the yellow light, would they not be able to see clearly? You know, everything... Everything that is a longer wavelength than the blue and the violet, it has to do with the way light refracts when it hits your cornea and your lens. And the, the, the blue and the violet light just refract more. So they come into focus in front. The example that I like to give, without really answering your question, I apologize, but I think this will answer it. The example I like to give is you're in a club on 6th Street. I know a lot of you guys are young, but here's how it goes. <laughs> okay? You're looking around, you're looking around, and there's nothing but ultraviolet lights on. And so you see somebody, you're talking, <laughs> right? And those UV lamps are on. And then you say, hey, what do you say? What do you, why don't we go get a slice of pizza or something? You step out into the harsh glare of those yellow sodium lights, and you're like, well, this person looks nothing like what I thought they looked like <laughs> in the club. That's because everything was a little bit blurry, and your brain was allowed to imagine whatever you wanted when it was all in blue and UV light. And you'll see this next time you're under UV lamp. If you notice, everything's going to look a little blurry and fuzzy for you. Some of that could be your cornea fluorescing too. Yes? At IBM, when the fire alarms went off, the red lights came on because it brought in high contrast and you could see the exits and things and obstacles better. Do you guys hear that? When uh, there's a fire alarm going off and the red light comes on, that is going to be enhancing the contrast. I had a student... That's a great example. I had a student... Um, a few years ago, who was in one of my classes, and when I explained this to him about the phobia and filtering out blurring blue light as an adaptation for boosting acuity, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, my job is custom paint jobs for cars. And he said, everybody in the business knows that when you put a blue paint job on a car and you're going back over it to look for imperfections in the paint job, you've got to get really close because you'll never see them from a distance. Same principle. So you'll find examples of this all over the place. There's somebody down here. Yes? Is colorblindness an issue with a phobia? No. Colorblindness is almost always... Carrie's the expert on this, by the way. Uh, my grad student who introduced me. Uh, colorblindness is almost always a genetic issue. And the original version of this talk had three parts. And you guys could imagine, you'd all be, you'd be asleep and half dead by the time I finished the third part. But uh, an ability to see lots of different colors with three primary colors... Right, to mix and match and make all the other colors, that evolves in the last common ancestor of old world monkeys, apes, and humans, a group called the Caterines. It's probably an adaptation for spotting red and orange fruits against a leafy green background. So if you're red-green colorblind, you can't see the difference between red and green, right? So you can't spot the red cherry against the green leaves. So it's yet another feeding adaptation. Now, the, the way we end up with that is we end up with three different genes that control our ability to see these three different primary colors. And uh, two of those genes are on the X chromosome. And so guys have only got one X, right? Is that right? Yeah. Anyway, yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Professor Watson. <laughs> uh, you know, it's true. Humans, have, uh, uh, males have only got one X. And so they've only got one copy of each of those genes. And so they're vulnerable to... Color blindness, right? So if one of those, if one of those copies, uh, one of those two gene copies on your X chromosome goes wonky, there's no backup. And so that's why something like 80, 90 percent of the colorblind humans are males. We're vulnerable because of the genetics, because it's an X-linked trait. And so whenever you lose color vision abilities, it's almost always something going wrong with one of those three genes. Long-winded answer, but that was, I answered? Okay. Yes? Yeah. 
God, what a great question. What a great question. So, I love it. So, the question was, thank you. Why do birds have two phobias? What does that do for you? Do you remember when you said raptors and I said most raptors like eagles have their eyes pointing off at a 45 degree angle? One of those phobias in each eye looks directly out along the optic axis for monocular scanning for high acuity. So when a, uh, and, and another thing I'll mention is that all of the benefits of high acuity for depth perception really accrue within about 20 feet of your head. So if you're a raptor, uh, I don't know, 300 feet above the ground and you're circling red tail hawk around Hyde Park and you're looking down with one eye, you can switch back and forth and use that laterally facing phobia at a distance. But when a raptor fixates with binocular vision, the other two phobia point directly at the point of fixation. So it, it's, I mean, it's really, it's really nice adaptation, let's be honest. It's the best of both worlds. You've got excellent high acuity in your visual periphery, and then you've also got excellent high acuity in your, very, your narrow region of binocular overlap in front of your beak. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Yes. What about the whites of the eyes in humans? As I told Commander Ben, <laughs> uh, you might wonder, Dr. Kirk, where are our large canines for threatening other humans? Where are our scary white eye patches for flashing visual signals? Where is our brightly colored mandrel nose that tells what our androgen levels are? Uh, if you look across monkeys and apes, but mainly monkeys, you'll see lots of brightly colored faces and genitals and things like that. They're almost always honest signals of something that's going on internally. Um, I'm not trying to be crass, but it's uh, in cercopithecoid monkeys, these are old world monkeys like baboons and things like that, it's called a red, white, and blue disp display because the scrotum is blue, the, um, uh, the, the, the penis is red, and the perianal skin is white. And the, the intensity of the colors is related to things like how high are your testosterone levels? Or better yet, how do you perceive your position within the hierarchy of male monkeys within this group? And if you perceive your position to be low, androgen levels drop or serotonin levels drop, and you start going drab. And if you're the big bad male, right? <laughs> Androgen levels are up, serotonin levels are up, and you get these brilliant colors and things like that. So the question could profitably be asked, where is this with humans? Where are our brightly colored parts and things like that? And the answer is they're looking right at you. When I can, okay, so let's see. Uh, who can I see? Who do I know? John Hamlet, my best friend from high school. Can you see that I'm looking at you right now? Why can you see that I'm looking at you? The difference, the contrast in your eyes. Contrast in my eyes. Let's test this, okay? Am I looking at you? No. Am I looking at you now? Yes. yes. <laughs> what did I say about threats at a distance? What did I say about social communication? That what's, excuse me, what's really cool about having visible whites to our eyes is uh, what you're looking at is you're looking at a, a white tunic around your eyeball called the sclera. It's what holds all the jelly-like stuff in, okay? And it's white in most mammals, but it's usually hidden from view. Loads of anthropoids, monkeys, apes, and humans, hide the whites of their eye with a pigmented conjunctiva. And that's because, you know, some of the time a monkey doesn't want you to know where it's looking, right? I remember when, uh, when I was an undergrad here and I was dealing with a monkey colony and you know, recording behavior, and I was looking through a one-way mirror, the monkeys would come up and park in front of the mirror and sit there and stare at me. And at first I was like, this mirror doesn't work. They can see that I'm here. Then I'd follow their gaze and I'd realize they're looking around the room. And they're observing all the social interactions behind them by looking in the mirror. So they can see what's going on socially without running the risk of getting a beat down for staring at the wrong person. Person. Monkey. Anyway. They're all primates. What are you going to do? So, in any case... Uh, uh, I would say there's, there's uh, a fairly good evidence that the reason that we have visible whites to our eye is part of this adaptation for social communication. This is the equivalent of the brightly colored mandrel's nose or the white eye patches in that gelata that you saw, something like that. Do you buy it? He's nodding charitably. Okay, good. <laughs> there are a couple of papers on this. Anybody who wants a paper on that, email me and I'll let you know. Yes? That, I should have the answer to that question. There was a student, um, 
There was a student, Karen Acre, who was in integrated biology, who did her dissertation on uh, squid not too long ago. I should know what cephalopod acuity is. I can't tell you off the top of my head. What I can tell you is this. It's not as good as ours. I know that. Cuttlefish, right? Squid, octopus. What's really cool about cephalopod eyes is they've got all the same, at least octopus and squid, they've got all the same parts as our eyes. Corneas, lenses, retinas, you name it. The cool thing is they've evolved completely independently from our own eyes. It's an example of a good functional anatomical structure evolving, evolving more than once in separate lineages. And one of the ways I know that they evolved independently is that in cephalopod eyes, the retina faces the correct way, if you will. <laughs> the photoreceptors are on the inner surface so that the light can get straight to it. They're not on the back side like ours. So there's a partial answer to a question you didn't ask. How was that? Yes. Yes. That is a great, that's a great question. You guys hear that? What is, what is human blindness all about? The, the, uh, the answer is you can interrupt the visual system anywhere on the pathway from incoming light getting into your eye to the later stages of processing in your brain and you can end up blind or with serious visual impairment. Here's an example. Uh, a cataract is a clouding of your lens and if untreated, you'll effectively be completely blind even if your retina and everything else is functioning perfectly. Here's the opposite example. Imagine that your retina is sending all of these beautiful high acuity color signals, everything motion to your brain, but you've had some sort of a stroke localized to your primary visual cortex. You're still not going to see it. So it could be at the level of the brain, you could snip the optic nerve, you could have a problem with your retina, you could have a problem with admitting light into your eye. If anything goes wrong there, you could end up blind. There was somebody, yes? Um, do, you do you use the colored part of your eye to see? No, the colored part of your eye, this is really pretty cool, that is your iris. And you notice that the iris, the colored bit, is around a... a usually a very round hole. In some other species, it's not round, but like you've seen bar-shaped pupils and goats and things like that. But the hole is what's admitting the light. The, the, the colored iris is uh, a side effect of the way pigments are distributed, usually melanin, the same thing that makes skin dark. Um, it's the way melanin granules are distributed from the front to the back of the iris. And so it doesn't have anything to do with how you see per se. I don't know about social communication, but uh, I, I, I'm fairly confident in saying that when you don't have much pigment or any pigment there, you end up with blue irises. When you have lots of pigment, you end up with dark brown irises. Does that answer your question? Yeah, colored contacts don't affect your vision because if you look at the contact, I think I'm right about this, there's always a space in the middle that's clear, right? Where, no, that's not true. I thought it was, I've never worn colored contacts, so I don't know. I, I mean, I, I assume that if, if, it's, if it's colored all the way across, you're going to get some sort of a tint to your vision. No? Okay, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. about there we go. Chris, there's a young lady in front of the spotlight. Who's ah, yes. Up for oh, hi. Yes. Animal, animals, oh, 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 right, right. Yeah, the tarsiers. You know, a tarsier has actually, compared to other mammals, has got a very respectable brain size. At the same time, what it also has are the largest eyes relative to head or body size of any living organism on this planet. So, yeah, exactly. So, don't think of it as small brain. Think of it as ridiculously big eyes. And... The reason, there's, there's speculation about this. It's an excellent question. Papers have been written on that very question. But what seems to be going on with tarsiers, tarsiers have got phobias, right? I didn't tell you about tarsier phobias. Tarsiers, for a nocturnal species, that is, they're active only at night, have got as many cones crammed into their phobias as lots of diurnal rodents and things like this. 
So they have these really weird, but they've also got rods, unlike you and me, inside their, their phobias. These are cells that are good for seeing at night. So tarsiers have got unique phobias in and of themselves. And um, when you have a phobia, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to mess up the image that it samples. Okay, backing up. Most, you've seen the, 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 the eye shine of deer in the headlights, right? The way most mammals that are active at night boost their visual sensitivity, their ability to see at night, is they put a mirror behind their retina. Because for every incoming photon, it's only got a 50-50 chance of being absorbed on the first pass. So what you do if you want to boost your ability to detect more photons at night, more light particles, is you put a mirror behind your retina and you let any photons that make it through your retina without being absorbed, you let them bounce off and give them another shot. And then anything that passes back out through the pupil is the eye, sign that you sh eye shine that you see at night. Okay, back to tarsiers. Tarsiers don't want to have this, this thing, this eye shine is caused by a reflective membrane called a tapetum lucidum. In Latin, it means bright carpet. Lots of animals have them. They help you see at night. Tarsiers, even though they have to see at night, don't want a tapetum lucidum because that would mess up their acuity. It would scatter light inside, inside their eye. It would blur the image. And so the way tarsiers have compensated for wanting to have very high acuity at night with a phobia is the way they boost sensitivity is not, a, not to put a mirror in the back of their eye, it's to make the eye bigger and bigger and bigger until you end up with an eye... An, an, their, their corneas are as big as yours and mine, even though they could sit in the palm of your hand. That was a very long answer to a very good question, but did I answer your question okay? Okay, thanks. Yeah? So, why don't all mammals have phobias? That's such a neat idea. Why is the photoreceptor supposed to be adaptation for it? Why don't all mammals have phobias if it's so great? Um, um, you, you've heard the expression, if a frog had wings, it wouldn't bump its tiny a hoppin, right? <laughs> I can think of lots of cool things to have. <laughs> yeah, so what's the advantage there? The point is that there isn't any advantage. The point is that that's a constraint on the ability of most mammals to boost their acuity beyond a certain point. And so this is a great example of how evolution does not lead to optimal adaptations. You know, you get what you've inherited, you press some things for service in a new function, right? I mean, uh, and, and, and in this case, what you have is that mammals are inheriting from their mammalian common ancestor a retina that's flipped. And the backstory is really interesting. The backstory is that during the, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, most mammals, mammalian ancestors, uh, you get VP people, close your ears, please, for a second. Most you know, early or later occurring mammal-like reptiles are doing their best not to be eaten by dinosaurs. And so they go nocturnal to avoid predation. And it's at night when uh, these early ancestors of the living mammals today lose their great vision that was there primitively, but evolve an excellent sense of smell and a, and a great sense of hearing. And so for most mammals... Right? Most mammals inherit great smell, great hearing, and good enough vision. And so unless you've got selection pressure to really boost high acuity to an extreme, you're not going to end up with a phobia. In fact, there's some suggestion that the phobia sits at a metabolic knife's edge because one of the things you also don't find in the phobia is you don't find blood vessels on the inner surface of the phobia. And a lot of macular degeneration is of a type where the blood vessels on the backside of the phobia start to proliferate for whatever reason. They mess up your phobia in the area around it. Um, your phobia is so hungry, your retina is so hungry for oxygen, all you have to do is stand up rapidly and uh, has anybody stood up suddenly and they get a head rush and their vision fades out and then it comes back in? It's because you deprived your hungry, hungry retina of oxygen and glucose for just a split second. And that was enough to shut it down. So your... I don't know. Well, see, that's, just, that's what I was trying to avoid saying. You said the phobia adaptation is very costly. No. I'm not going to be pinned down into saying that. I'm not going to be. <laughs> These are very good questions. Very good questions. How about if I just say that? Hey, hey Chris. Yeah. Chris, we have time for one more question. But before we do, we have a... Whoops. You're good. We have an award for the best question this evening. It's the young lady in front of the spotlight. So come on down and get your very rare Hello Kitty Pez dispenser. <laughs> hey! These are hard to find. You can, you can, uh, and you, you're also the most patient question asker. I know. I'm really sorry about that. I, it's, I, so it's, what you can see is 
where you were. It's like looking into the sun, isn't it? We, we had no idea you were back there. Thanks for being patient and for your question. That was a very good question. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. All right, so a, a final question for Professor Kirk. Go ahead and... I promise I'll keep it short, if I can. Somebody, she's already asked one. Anybody else? Yes, yes. Hi. <laughs> My mind is being blown by the last question. Um, I, could you say that again a little bit louder? We indicate so much more subtly. It's all like reserved to our space where we used to be so aggressive, like in these really distinct forms of like love and affection and aggression and hate. Would you say that it's like made us want to explain ourselves and like put it to words and like writing? There's so many layers upon layers of of good questions that are, that are in that one statement that you just made. Let me see if I can answer it this way. So, so the, the question is basically, let me know if I'm doing you justice. The question is, you know, does the subtlety of social communication present in anthropoids and humans in particular lead to a desire to express ourselves? I don't, I, I don't see that idea is much more complicated than any other animal language we come across. But what I will say is the subtlety of emotions and the sorts of things that are being communicated non-verbally in a chimpanzee or a gorilla or an orangutan, I'd say, I'd say it's almost all there. So I... I, I wouldn't presuppose that they, and, I, and I'm a good scientist, I'm not supposed to talk about animal emotions and things like that because I don't know what's going on in anybody else's head, right? I might be a brain in a vat of nutrient broth right now, right? <laughs> that being said, you go to the Houston Zoo and you see those chimps there and you watch them interact for a little bit, you know there are lots of complicated emotions going on and there is some really complicated social interaction on display. So... Yeah, you know, I, I, like, I like language as sort of a further, your notion of language as a further extension of all of the communication that goes on. Because one thing I will say is, outside of primates, you don't find that sociality is the norm. I mean, everybody's used to seeing in nature videos uh, herds of zebra and wildebeest and things like that. That's not true sociality, right? And, and uh, Tony DiFiore, I hope he's not cringing, he's our primate behaviorist in the back row up there. But, you know, in a herd of wildebeest, one wildebeest doesn't know that the wildebeest next to him's name is Frank or Bob or whatever. You know, it's like there aren't these individual repeated interactions, even though the animals get together in these big aggregates. I would say the norm in primates is to have repeated social interactions with the same individuals over long periods of time. So I would say some sort of, and that's not true for all primates, but for many primates, some sort of tendency towards sociality and the need to communicate that comes with that, that's a really common thing in our order. Yeah? Did I do okay? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Let's thank Chris for his cool talk. Thank you. Appreciate it.